In this episode, we'll be talking about subjects around ethics in true crime, as we do from time to time. If you prefer our newsier, case-centric episodes, it's one to skip. Back in early April of this year, a series of tweets from Sarah Turney that had been widely liked popped up in my Twitter feed. Turney, of course, is a well-known figure in true crime circles. Her sister, Alyssa, disappeared on May 17, 2001. In 2020, Turney's father, Michael, was arrested and charged with second-degree murder in Alyssa's case. Sarah Turney has spoken about the case widely, and she's also covered it herself on her own ongoing podcast, Voices for Justice. She also participated in another earlier podcast called Missing Alyssa. Let me read from Turney's recent tweets. I had to create a whole other podcast because the creator of the Missing Alyssa podcast did not want me or her intern advocating for my father's arrest. Then when I did, she took me to court. I was stunned. I'd never had to hire a lawyer before. I basically spent my life savings paying to get my right to talk about my sister back. That caught my interest for a few reasons. For one thing, if it was true, it would make journalist Otavia Zapala the creator of the Missing Alyssa podcast, a truly horrible person. Taking away the right of someone to talk about their missing sister? That would be disgusting, and anyone who did it would deservedly be shunned by respectable people in true crime. But here's the thing. It couldn't possibly be true. I'm an attorney, and I can tell you, that's not how the legal system works. I cannot imagine a ridiculous suit like that being filed and having any chance of succeeding. And what's more, we both know from personal experience that Sarah Turney, despite her high-volume claims that she is an ethical person, has repeatedly made up things about people she doesn't like to bring the wrath of her internet following down upon them. That's what she did to us about a year ago. We'll link to our episode talking about that in our show notes. So, when we saw Turney's wild claims on Twitter... Our first instinct was to be concerned for Otavia. We remember how lonely it felt after Turney's lies sparked a wave of harassment against us. We wanted to let Otavia know she was not alone. Frankly, she was hard to find. All of the social media related to the Missing Alyssa podcast has been wiped from the web. That made us feel even more worried for her. A person would not erase their online connection to their work unless something truly bad had happened. But we did succeed in finding her. And she was very open with us. She shared with us all of the legal documents related to the court action involving Sarah Turney. We can tell you, they completely supported our instinct, that Sarah Turney's posts about Octavia's suit were fiction. We will quote from those case documents throughout this episode, and we'll also make them available for you to read and evaluate for yourself. The case documents are not all that Otavia shared. The key evidence in this case involved hundreds of text messages exchanged between her and Sarah Turney. We reviewed all of those as well. Now, these texts are highly personal, and they reveal a number of things about Turney that would surely shock her supporters. But the purpose of this episode is not to embarrass or humiliate anyone. Our goal instead is to allow Otavia to protect herself from the false charge the attorney brought against her, and also to explain the real reasons why she chose to take Sarah Turney to court. So we will strive to be incredibly selective with the material we use from these texts. And, like the court documents, we will also make a selection of them available so you can read them and evaluate them for yourself. Let us stress the crucial point here. Turney spread an awful story that seems designed to destroy the reputation of a podcaster who brought public attention to her sister's case. Can there be any rational reason for why the allegedly ethical Turney would choose to share inaccurate information that appears calculated to make the public hold Otavia in contempt? Perhaps Turney's own words can provide a clue. Here's a quick quote from Turney that we took from the November 4th, 2021 episode of her Voices for Justice podcast. Honestly, for a newer creator, or even for someone like myself, just a few dozen people outright attacking your credibility 
or attacking your podcast can literally ruin you. Is it possible that Turney was using her platform to deliberately spread a lie, a lie that would result in people attacking Atavia for the purpose of ruining a podcast rival? We are going to share the whole story of what happened between Atavia and Turney so you can decide for yourself if Turney's actions were in any way justifiable. We are going to analyze some of Turney's more hyperbolic claims around her own experiences and true crime in general. We believe that the actions we will discuss fly in the face of the so-called true crime ethics that Turney so loudly proclaims. We feel it is important to hold those with massive platforms accountable for dishonest and harassing behavior. And early on, when we were discussing whether or not to proceed with this episode, we found guidance in the words of Sarah Turney herself. Here, for instance, is something she said on the June 1st, 2023 episode of Voices for Justice. These are really important issues that people need to know as they consume true crime. It's not just gossip. It's not just being mean. It's like, you should know this is how the final product that you're receiving is made. Because I think it's important. I maybe, I'm just that person. Like, I want to know, like, where do my eggs come from? Like, are these chickens being treated nice? Yeah. You know, like, I am that person. I am a very, I try to be anyway, the best I can. A conscious consumer. So, let's be conscious consumers. We all care about the concept of ethics, fairness, and compassion in true crime. So, to quote Turney, let's see where the eggs come from. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is Voiceless No Longer, the creator of Missing Alyssa Speaks Out. Before we hear from Atavia, we want to firmly establish a few things. We did not just take Atavia's word for anything. As we noted, she gave us access to her history of text with Turney, as well as the court papers. These all support Atavia's story and refute Turney's public claims about her and the lawsuit. We should also note that in the time since she created Missing Alyssa, Atavia has gotten married and is now known as Atavia McHenry. This is not a story about the end of a friendship. That's a private situation and not newsworthy in our opinion. It's also not a story about a victim's family member quarreling with a true crime journalist or criticizing a podcast for its content or approach. Again, it would not be newsworthy if Turney was merely getting out and saying that Atavia had hurt her feelings or that she didn't like the show Missing Alyssa. The reason we are covering this is because it's ultimately a story about a creator using her large platform to lie about a professional rival in order to damage her career. So, although we reviewed a wide swath of texts and materials that get into some surprising statements and conduct, we only seek to report on items connected to the lies Turney has spread about Atavia. 
Now, what happened between Atavia and Turney is a complicated story and a deeply personal one. It's a story for Atavia herself to share. Hi, I'm Otavia McHenry. Before I tell you the full story, I'm going to answer the number one question that is likely on your mind at this point, because I'm not trying to drag anything out. So, did I sue Sarah Turney to get her to stop talking about her sister? Did I bring Sarah Turney to court to prevent her from advocating for her father's arrest? No, of course not. What I did do is seek out an injunction against harassment against Sarah Turney. Under Arizona law, an injunction against harassment is a type of protective order, also known as a restraining order, except the person harassing you doesn't have to be related to you in any way. Long story short, I asked the court to sign a document that prevented Sarah Turney from spreading harmful lies and rumors about me on the internet. This document is a public record. Anybody can get a copy of it, and I will be reading from it here during this episode. More about that later on. Back to my story. I'm an investigative journalist, and in 2016, I set out to make my first podcast series. I was researching the story of a missing girl named Alyssa Turney. Despite a thorough and exhaustive investigation conducted by Detectives Summershoe and Anderson of the Phoenix Police Department in 2008, the case couldn't be closed at the time. When I set out to make my podcast, the case had gone cold again, and there hadn't been any media coverage since ABC's program 2020 aired a compelling segment in 2009. During the course of my preliminary research, I got in touch with several people, including Alyssa's sister, Sarah Turney. We met in person, and I explained to her what I was thinking about doing. She agreed to be interviewed, and over the course of months, we recorded several interviews together. I launched the podcast called Missing Alyssa in 2017. Over time, Sarah and I grew closer and we became friends. I continued putting update episodes out throughout 2018 as I gathered more interviews or new information on the case, including an interview with the victim's father, Michael Turney, the lead suspect in the case. In June of 2019, my friendship with Sarah ended. Let me just start by saying that I'm not at all happy to discuss these private events in public, which is the main reason I haven't until today. The reason I'm talking about it now is because I have no other choice. Over the course of the last four years, Sarah has made various false accusations against me on public platforms such as social media or in private to other people. Of course, it's had a really terrible impact on me and affected me very much even though I'm very private about my feelings. I don't follow Sarah on social media, so each time I found out only if and when someone else brought it to my attention. And each time I opted not to respond. I've tried to ignore it, hoping that someday Sarah Turney would move on and stop lying about events surrounding our falling out and leave me alone. It's been really hard to read the hurtful comments that some of her online followers wrote on those posts Sarah wrote about me. Seeing people insult me, threaten me, discuss the false allegations, and even offer sympathy to Sarah, knowing that they were based on lies, is very difficult. It was at times tempting to respond and challenge the narratives that Sarah had crafted over the years. But I never joined the conversation, never defended myself, never asked my friends for support. I told myself that when allegations are ridiculous, it's not worth engaging with them that it could just make things worse. On one hand, I don't wish to give a platform to toxic social media content. On the other, though, where does one draw the line and defend themselves against false accusations? I tried the approach of staying silent for years, and it clearly didn't work. It's now been four years since my friendship with Sarah ended. During this time, I have stopped any work on Alyssa's case, shut down the website and social media, I've shied away from media attention and turned down several requests for interviews on the case. But surprisingly, Sarah is still to this day making false accusations and spreading rumors about me publicly, seemingly with the aim of discrediting me on a personal and professional level. I'm really confused as to why, and I know that other people that know the whole story are as well, It seems counterproductive to invite public scrutiny into a private matter 
forcing me to respond when, in my opinion, if exposed, the story would be embarrassing for the person drawing attention to it. Either way, at this point, I owe it to myself to respond to some of these allegations and defend myself. I don't have a lot of hope that it will make the harassment stop or that Sarah will admit to lying, but that's not why I'm doing it. This is a matter of self-respect and standing up for myself. Because unfortunately, too often, people believe what they read on social media, even if it isn't backed up by any evidence, even if it doesn't make sense. And people have a tendency to believe the loudest and most aggressive voice on social media. And if the person being accused of something doesn't respond, some people interpret that as proof that they are guilty. I really want to stay away from gossip or being salacious, so I'm going to try and stick to the essential points only, the details that are necessary to defend myself. I'm going to list some of these false accusations that Sarah has made against me over the years and challenge them one by one with facts and evidence that prove them to be false. Thankfully, they are very easy to disprove and I didn't have to work very hard to do so. The murder sheet ensures that we stay busy running around and reporting on true crime stories. That means that HelloFresh has become a key part of keeping our week less hectic. This is America's number one meal kit for a reason. We've enjoyed the journey of becoming at-home chefs and preparing delicious meals without blowing our budget or wasting a ton of time. One recent dish we really enjoyed was the spicy Peruvian chicken and loaded rice with pickled jalapeno and creamy salsa verde. The chicken was nice and tasty with plenty of spicy flavors. HelloFresh really knows how to pick out ingredients, so you're getting that farm-to-table feel. One thing that was almost as good as the food was the peace of mind knowing that I didn't botch a grocery trip and forget a key ingredient. We could just be in the moment and have fun cooking together. Whatever your goals are this summer, consider HelloFresh. If you're looking to connect with friends and family with some backyard cookouts, then keep in mind their crowd-pleasing options like snack boards, with pretzel bites, spice bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. And if you're trying to mind your health and eat well, you can opt for the calorie smart or protein smart options. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16 and use code MSheet16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16 and use code MSheet16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Before I do that, I'll need to explain the context. That is the reason why our friendship deteriorated in the first place, so that her accusations can make more sense. First off, I'll be the first to admit I don't really fully understand the reasons behind the quote-unquote falling out. They make little sense to me. Some seem trivial, others are unreasonable, Here are the major ones. Based on our text, the core of the issue for her was my wanting to maintain an impartial stance in my reporting, in the public sphere such as social media. So in other words, I was trying to do my job as a journalist to stay professional and therefore credible. During a panel in June 2019 at CrimeCon, I highlighted that there's a difference between the work of journalists that focus on true crime and victims' advocates. I said that I was a journalist. That made Sarah really angry, even though she only said so after CrimeCon. When we attended CrimeCon in 2019, there was an 18-year-old girl with us named Brooke. Brooke had come to learn about Alyssa's story, maybe by listening to my podcast, and later connected with Sarah online. Brooke was passionate about the case and started advocating for justice. Later, she also went on to assist me with certain podcast-related tasks, such as posting on social media. We called her an intern. Anyway, Brooke wanted to attend CrimeCon as well, and I got her a ticket to the event. There was a time while Brooke and I were sitting at the podcast booth, and people were coming to meet and greet, and at some point, Brooke told these two ladies that we were advocating for Michael Turney's arrest. I later told Brooke in private that while she's representing Missing Alyssa, I'd rather that she maintained a more neutral stance when talking to other people. As a reminder, this was over a year before charges were brought against Michael Turney. 
Also, I don't recall if Brooke was aspiring to go to college for journalism at the time or something similar. Either way, I advised her against it and suggested that she say instead things like, we're trying to spread awareness surrounding the case or the podcast aims to bring answers to a case that went cold, which again, I completely stand behind to this day. This last event is what Sarah Turney is seemingly referring to when she claims that I tried to stop her and my intern for advocating for her father's arrest. That is stretching the truth to the point of it being unrecognizable. Soon after CrimeCon, Sarah and I were texting. Sarah had recently texted me about some concerns she had surrounding what Brooke had posted online on her private social media account. Sarah thought certain things that Brooke posted didn't look professional for the podcast. I didn't see a problem with the posts and stories that she was referencing. I was confused. I replied to her instead with a screenshot of one of Brooke's posts that was also on her personal account, where Brooke was posing alongside Nancy Grace, whom she had stood in line to meet at CrimeCon. The caption to that photo was an alleged quote from Nancy Grace saying that Michael Turney can, quote, rotten hell, end quote. I mentioned to Sarah that I wouldn't approve of that kind of stance professionally and that no reputable news source would publish something like that. And I still stand behind that, especially concerning an individual that hadn't yet been charged with homicide. But really, I wouldn't want to post that about anybody. That's the kind of comment I would think to myself or say out loud to my friends, not something I'd publish on any work-related platform. So those events are what really precipitated the whole falling out. Sarah was really angry. I was really confused. During the following two months, Sarah sent me many awful text messages. Here are a few. You think I knew you wouldn't want to publicly advocate for his prosecution and I'd be cool with that? Come on. When you publicly said you were a journalist, not an advocate, what did you think my reaction would be? I want you to have a great life that doesn't involve screwing other victims' families. Again, it comes back to you having your best interests at heart, not Alyssa's like a true journalist. You are a liar and a user. I'm done being nice. Good luck with that karma. Talking to you is like talking to my dad. You're a toxic narcissist. Just believe that I'm jealous of you for being naturally thin and beautiful. LOL. Seriously, I worry about you, man. Good luck figuring all of that shit out. Just to be clear, you were shitty and not respectful before I tweeted this morning. What you did was fucked up. This doesn't look good for you. You weren't thinking about Alyssa. You were thinking, fuck Sarah. Dude, listen to yourself. I'm really worried about you. I think you were selfish and cruel. You know you're provoking me. I want you to do what you say or else I'm going to call you out on your shit. You swung your dick around like you owned her and that I would have to get over it like it's your brand. I get that you need to keep your brand in mind, but please remember you wouldn't have one without My mission isn't to harm you or your career, but if you're lying and I'm asked about it, I'm going to defend myself. If you want to be a journalist and not an advocate, that's your prerogative. For someone who knows so much about the case and not fight for it like I honestly thought you were for years is a shit. You're not feeling. an advocate for the victim. You're a predatory journalist who breaks the moral code when it suits you. You were never my friend. You picked a great workhorse. Good luck finding another How one. How fucking dare you? You say you don't want war, but you are hell bent on starting one. There were a lot of accusations towards me. Just out of the blue, it seemed like she suddenly had a problem with everything I did and didn't do. And when I say out of the blue, I mean, one, because we'd never fought before. Two, because she never raised any concerns about any of these things while they were happening or shortly after. So it was a kitchen sinking of everything all at once. And three, because the things she was angry about are unreasonable. During the previous two years, she didn't have any issues with me or the podcast. She always praised the podcast. Then, suddenly, her opinion changed drastically without me changing anything about the way I was working. I really started to feel uncomfortable with the whole situation. It started feeling controlling to me. At the same time as she was texting me those things, she was pushing me to post more content, even when I didn't feel like there was anything relevant to post. She criticized how I spent my time. She said I spent too much time off or doing yoga, which of course wasn't true. But either way, it was making me really uncomfortable how I felt like she wanted to dominate the direction of my work and my time. It was inappropriate. At that point, of course, I started taking a step back or a break from the podcast and social media. 
I had made 13 episodes at that stage, and there wasn't really a lot of new content or information to make another episode. Although I had some content I'd started putting together on the back burner before we fought. But I obviously put it on hold given what was happening. Surprisingly, and very confusingly, this also seemed to upset Sarah. These are some of the texts she sent me on that subject. Why didn't you release the audio from the other panel? I never asked you to stop putting out content for Alyssa, not once. You know I would never say that. You didn't because you were mad and you wanted to move on. Why wouldn't you have released a new episode in six months if you had all of that stuff? Nope. Never once have I asked anyone not to publish anything about Alyssa. Then do it. Publish everything. I never asked you to stop. But do I want you to keep putting out episodes? Yes. Why? Because it's about Alyssa. Not me. Not you. Not this fight. I mean, you told people on Twitter that you would publish more episodes when there were updates. So that's what I thought. Then why not for the past six months? When I begged you for more exposure. There's no stepping on anyone's toes. There's enough room for everyone. In one message, Sarah even seems to imply that podcasters should continue to cover a victim's case, regardless of what the victim's family thinks. She wrote, No, because it's not about the family. It's about the victim. Tim said Fred Murray doesn't like him. Did they stop talking about Mora? This text message was confusing to me at the time, but it's even more confusing now. Knowing that Sarah Turney's stance has long been that creators should unilaterally defer to a victim's family member. But here, Sarah seems to be praising other content creators for covering cases regardless of their relationship with the victim's family because, quote, it's not about the family, end quote. What's more, she's asking me to continue creating content on her sister's case while simultaneously accusing me of exploiting her and of being a predatory journalist, a user. As we mentioned, we viewed the text shared between Atavia and Turney over the years. After the falling out, we would characterize Turney's texts as increasingly possessive. Time and time again, she demanded that Atavia continue to perform labor around Alyssa's case. It's an interesting detail because she has often complained about the exploitative nature of true crime and has often pointed out that journalists and media outlets typically don't pay victims' family members for interviews. In a 2022 interview with Collier Landry, Turney likened victims' family members to unsung factory workers. We believe she was attempting to say that victims' family members are essential but underappreciated and underpaid in the true crime industry. We're not going to debate the merits of that statement, We just wish to point out that it's odd that one so interested in equity and empowerment would essentially attempt to dictate a friend's workload and output. Keep in mind, Missing Alyssa was a fully formed series at this point. It covered the case in depth and got the word out there. We know the people working in law enforcement, the court system, and politics at a local level paid attention to this podcast and felt it sparked more discussion on Alyssa's case. Having listened to the program, we feel that its tone was respectful and that it did a good job telling Alyssa's story from a journalistic perspective. In her text, we saw that Turney expressed a hatred of journalists. At one point, she accused Atavia of having her own best interest at heart, like a true journalist, she said. For Turney, calling someone a journalist was apparently a zinger of an insult. She also seemed to have an idea that it's somehow wrong for a reporter to do work on one story and then move on to another story. She apparently viewed that as a betrayal. But that's frankly unreasonable. A journalist who does a good job covering a story isn't indebted to their initial sources for life to the point where they should take editorial direction from them forever. If they seek to then report on another case, that is fine. What's more... The increasingly entitled and aggressive rhetoric that Turney leveled at Atavia would make most professionals yearn to move on and distance themselves. What we observed seemed to be a game of push and pull. Turney was pushing Atavia away with accusatory language about how she's a bad person, as well as vague threats to reveal that to her social media following. Those were followed up with pull tactics. Specifically, claims that Atavia owed Turney and ought to keep covering the case. Or else was the implicit message that we got. Now, even from the perspective that Turney may have been addressing Atavia as a friend and not a journalist, 
this seemed to become an unhealthy and draining dynamic. Friends do not mount long-term campaigns to dictate friends' professional behavior based on guilt trips, pity ploys, loyalty tests, and vague threats. This was not a both-sides issue either. Atavia, for the most part, comes off as non-confrontational, apologetic to a fault, and generally confused. Atavia repeatedly questioned why Turney would even want her to continue covering Alyssa's case if she had such a negative opinion about her and missing Alyssa. Ultimately, after months of this back and forth, we can absolutely understand why Atavia felt the need to set a hard boundary and enforce it with her harassment suit. Reading these texts was a frankly disturbing and exhausting experience, and we're just third-party observers to this situation. Now, to be clear, nobody's saying that Turney isn't allowed to have an opinion about coverage of her sister's case. Of course she is. She's also allowed to get mad at Atavia over a disagreement about the direction of that coverage. She's allowed to walk away and do her own thing. That's all fine. Had Turney simply not wanted to associate with Atavia anymore because she disapproved of her wanting to move on, or her prioritizing of journalism over activism, that too would be fine. But of course, that's not what happened. This wasn't simply about Turney letting Atavia know her feelings or expressing anger, frustration, or hurt. We're looking at demands and manipulations here. I personally don't think it's a stretch to say that Turney's communications with Atavia verged into emotionally abusive territory. I use that term because of Turney's consistent attempts to control Atavia's behavior through shaming and blaming. And this became more than a personal matter the moment Turney decided to post about it to her large following. Another event that caused Sarah to lash out at me was a social media campaign that Brooke was running on her own advocacy for Alyssa social media account. The campaign was called Alyssa Week and urged people to take certain actions on each day of the week. I don't recall details, but I think one of these was to hound the county attorney's office with phone calls on a given day. We just want to say that we don't want to live in a country where a prosecutor can be urged to arrest the person of your choice if you manage to prompt enough TikTok or Twitter followers to make a phone call. That's just not how the law is supposed to work. Frankly, it just seems like a harassment campaign that would distract a prosecutorial staff from the work they need to be doing. This was Brooke's personal initiative, and I wasn't involved with it. I don't recall all the details, but again, I didn't feel like it was something that belonged on the podcast, and I didn't agree with all of its calls to action. I was also feeling really confused and hurt about the flurry of upsetting messages Sarah had been sending me by that point. Oddly, Sarah became angry that I wasn't sharing the Alyssa Week campaign on social media. She texted the following messages. There are so many podcasts sharing Alyssa Everyone is wondering why the hell Missing Alyssa isn't behind Alyssa Week. And when I suspect it's because you want to be neutral, but then you do all this other shit that wasn't neutral, you cannot hide behind wanting to be neutral. Then on July 23rd, 2019, a fake Twitter account under the name Leslie Bryant, which had zero posts and zero followers and zero following, publicly confronted me as to why I wasn't posting anything about the Alyssa Week campaign. It felt like somebody was trying to pressure me to participate in the campaign. It felt like whenever I drew the line editorially on my own podcast, something as simple as I feel uncomfortable sharing this post or I don't agree with this idea or I'd rather word it this way than express it that way or even just set a boundary for myself, things didn't go down well. It's like I was either going to agree with Sarah and do what she wanted me to do or she got really angry. That's a really unhealthy dynamic. Around that time, I also started receiving strange anonymous messages from various online accounts, echoing some of the same things that Sarah said to me in her text messages. Obviously, I can't verify the origin of these messages and comments. All I can say is the timing and content of these coincided with our text message conversations. For instance, two days after Sarah first lashed out at me, a review popped up on Missing Alyssa by a Catherine Clayton. Narrator is cold and detached when speaking to the victim's sister. Sarah notified me of this review immediately, before I saw it. In a text she sent me, she used this review as supporting evidence that other people saw it her way too. 
This is what Sarah texted me. Read your reviews. People see how detached and cold you are. That review stood out among many other earlier reviews pointing out how sensitive my coverage of the case was or how the good rapport I had with Sarah was evident from our interaction on the podcast. I suspected that Sarah orchestrated that review because of the timing. I hinted at my suspicion and she didn't comment on it. Other similar comments started popping up as well. It was bizarre because it wasn't about the content of my work, it was personal. And they echoed the accusations I was receiving from Sarah directly. We want to add our two cents here. After Sarah Turney told lies about us on the fall line, in a segment where Turney and Laura Norton didn't name us, but made it pretty obvious who they were talking about, we experienced a wave of online harassment. That included phony-looking email addresses and several threats of violence. It was deeply upsetting at the time. These were two podcast hosts with bigger and better established platforms coming after us without even bothering to get their facts straight. And it seemed that, at the very least, that that had unleashed a torrent of harassment against us. This kind of online harassment is rough. It feels very real and alarming at least in the case of the violent threats. But it is virtually impossible to do anything about it. The courts have not yet caught up to the internet, and it can be difficult to assess what's a real risk and what's a string of empty words. Meanwhile, the resentful, manipulative text messages kept on coming, and I kept responding and tried to make peace on multiple occasions. I even started apologizing for things that I didn't really know why I was apologizing. I just wanted all of this to stop. I was trying to appease her. On July 21st, 2019, Sarah posted on Twitter that someone close to her had betrayed her. The post elicited a string of vengeful comments from her followers. In a text to me, Sarah Turney confirmed the post was about me. She said, I was tempted to tell people it was you. I told you I was tempted to be mean about this. These are a few of the comments to her post. You ever decide to fight, you know Alyssa Army is behind you. I'm so sorry. I can't even comprehend someone not being pure in their intentions for the situation. I wish I could do more for you. Sarah's reply was, The support is amazing. Maybe I shouldn't have posted this, lol. I should have known you guys would go to bat for me. People taking advantage just triggers me. It happens way too much in this business. Another comment said, Well, you're a better person than me because I have no doubt I would have put them on blast. Sarah's reply was, Trust me, it's tempting. But that would come in the form of a long YouTube video with a lot of receipts. I don't throw out accusations without a lot of proof. Trying to let it fizzle away. Another comment said, I'm so sorry to hear that you were burned. Another comment, Drop a name, girl. We just want to talk. Sarah replied, All things come to light in time. If I don't talk, I know other people will. More comments. Who do I need to beat up? Who do we have to fight? Who are we jumping? Who wants this ass whooping? I am so sorry to hear this. That anyone would do that to you is disgusting. What stands out here is the comment she made about how she doesn't throw out accusations without proof. And that she has a lot of quote-unquote receipts. I've been wondering, if indeed she has so much evidence, how come she hasn't produced any of it? For instance, the copy of the alleged lawsuit where I tried to prevent her from talking about Alyssa. She also mentions that if she doesn't talk, other people will. But with time, it appears that other people didn't talk after all. Maybe they didn't have anything substantial to say on the subject. Perhaps that's why Sarah felt compelled to keep talking. Long story short, I thought we had similar goals for justice to be done, awareness around some of the issues surrounding the case, for the case to be solved, etc. But the ways we went about achieving them were different. I did it my way for two years, and it didn't seem to be a problem for Sarah or anyone else involved. Shortly after Sarah started becoming more actively involved, out of nowhere, she took issue with everything I did or didn't do, if it differed from how she wanted it including me going about my work as a journalist, like I had been from the very beginning. There was endless arguing via text, and it seemed like our entire friendship, everything depended on whether we completely agreed on everything or not. 
it was really driving me crazy for a while. And then if I happen to like a post on Twitter from the Alyssa Week campaign, then it's like, well, how come you liked it if you weren't on board with participating? Can you really like something but not share it? You can't this and you can't that and endless debating. I didn't really know how to deal with it. She said something to me once like, are you okay? You're not making any sense. I'm really worried about you. It felt like she wanted me to think I was crazy. Once it seemed like there was no way of repairing the friendship, I tried to end things amicably and go our separate ways. But it didn't seem like Sarah was interested in doing that. It felt like there was an endless source of anger there and that it wasn't going to stop. Actually, on the contrary, she was ramping up. A few times, she mentioned exposing what I supposedly did to her. I felt like she wanted some form of revenge. Almost a year after we stopped talking, on April 7th, 2020, Sarah Turney published a post on Twitter telling her followers she might reveal the quote-unquote real story about why she started her own podcast. Here's what she posted. I've contemplated this for almost a year, but I think you guys will hear the real story about why I decided to cover Alyssa's story on VFJ Pod. There's still so much you guys don't know, and honestly, I'm done protecting people who don't care about me or Alyssa. The post didn't make any names, but I was certain it was about me. I will talk more about this later, but for now, I just want to add that Sarah herself recently confirmed it. The direct interaction between Sarah and I had ended, but it seemed like she was now taking the bullying to the internet. I didn't know how to make her stop. A week later, I petitioned the court for an injunction against harassment. I appeared before a judge, detailing and writing the various events to explain why I felt harassed, many of which I've read here, and the judge granted it. The injunction was signed by the judge, and those papers were later served to Sarah. Here's what I asked the court, in writing, on that petition. I asked that the defendant be prohibited from harassing me, bullying me, making defamatory claims or false statements against me on her podcast, her social media, or any medium. Be prohibited from alluding to my person or my business indirectly in a defamatory manner. Be prohibited from encouraging others by any means to harass me, cyberbully me, or write about me in a defamatory manner on the internet, or try to tarnish my professional reputation by writing negative reviews about my business. Sarah appealed the injunction, hired an attorney to represent her, and a hearing was set for May of 2020. At that point, I had to hire an attorney as well. This hearing was going to be in front of another judge. It was like a mini one-day trial without a jury. We both took the stand and were questioned by our own attorneys and each other's attorney. The judge asked Sarah whether her recent tweet was about me. Under oath, Sarah replied that the post she had recently published had nothing to do with me. The judge prompted her to explain what it was about. Sarah was vague as she stated it was about promoting her podcast. Here's that post again. I've contemplated this for almost a year, but I think you guys will hear the real story about why I decided to cover Alyssa's story on VFJ Pod. There's still so much you guys don't know, and honestly, I'm done protecting people who don't care about me or Alyssa. Ultimately, the court did not find that I had met the burden of proof that Sarah's behavior towards me qualified as harassment or that I truly felt harassed by her actions. In particular, the court believed that Turney's April 7, 2020 post was too vague to qualify as harassment against any particular individual. The judge also added that she believed Sarah when she testified that the post wasn't about me. The judge also said that since it couldn't be proven that the anonymous messages came from her, they couldn't be taken into account. During her ruling, the judge also said that these are private matters concerning the end of a friendship, and they didn't belong on social media. I was, of course, devastated by this ruling because, one, it hurts to have your experience of a traumatic event invalidated, to not be believed, and two, because I knew that Sarah wasn't going to stop there. Having won this appeal, she was going to feel even more freedom to continue harassing me since there were apparently no consequences. And in fact, as time has proven, she didn't stop. So here we are. Shortly after the hearing, Sarah's attorney filed a motion and application for award of attorney fees and costs. In other words, she wanted me to pay for her attorney's fees. 
Note that this is an unusual type of emotion that is used only in very specific instances. And according to various sources I consulted within the legal system, this situation did not meet the criteria. I've been told that it's rare for someone to be ordered to pay for the other party's attorney. So it seems bizarre that Sarah's attorney agreed to prepare such a motion. Due to this motion she filed, the judge had to schedule yet another hearing. That meant I had to hire an attorney a second time to respond to her motion in writing and represent me during the second hearing. Since this hearing seemed senseless and unreasonable, my attorney asked that Sarah pay for the fees I incurred for hiring an attorney to prepare this motion and represent me during this second hearing. I'm sorry for the boring technical details here. I had to include them because they will become necessary in a minute when I debunk one of Sarah's inaccurate statements. In the motion to award attorney fees or in the attached affidavit, Sarah wrote that she felt like the injunction against harassment I was seeking would have made it impossible for her to make a podcast about her sister or for her to post on social media. I don't follow the logic here at all. As my attorney wrote in the response, the injunction did not limit her right to free speech. Her posting on social media or making her own podcast is not incompatible with her legal obligation to comply with the law, including refraining from defaming or harassing anyone. The hearing was really brief, and the judge ruled that everyone was responsible for paying their own attorney's fees. Now that the context is laid out, I can address the false accusations made against me by Sarah. There are some lies, some half-truths, and a pattern of omissions that, when strung together, paint an inaccurate or false picture. First and foremost, Sarah has recently taken to posting that I took her to court to get her to stop talking about her sister. This isn't true by any stretch of the imagination. I hate to state the obvious, but you can't take someone to court to get them to stop talking about their sister. But judging from some of the comments to that post, there are a number of people who believed it. Let me break it down. On March 30th, 2023, BuzzFeed ran a story about true crime podcasts that helped solve crimes. The writer accidentally credited my podcast, Missing Alyssa, to Sarah instead of her podcast, Voices for Justice. That sent Sarah into a rage. Instead of just contacting BuzzFeed to correct their story, she retweeted it with the following comment. No. I had to create a whole other podcast because the creator of the Missing Alyssa podcast did not want me or her intern advocating for my father's arrest. Then when I did, she took me to court. This post was retweeted over 100 times, had over 1,300 likes and 20 plus comments. Soon after that tweet, she posted another one. Let me say, no need to send hate to anyone. But did that podcast open Alyssa's case? No. Did it spark the arrest? No. Did it traumatize the hell out of me and spark my passion for ethics and true crime? Yes. Here are a few of the comments to those posts. Pure trash. Makes my blood boil thinking about her. The nerve. This is disgusting. What the fuck? Just shows you they don't have the right intentions. Ugh, once again, I'm so sorry, Sarah. What on earth was her reasoning? That makes absolutely no sense. I can't even imagine how angry you must have been. I don't know how she had the nerve to do that to you. Makes me so angry. God, this is awful. I'm so sorry this happened to you. The audacity she has. Why on earth would they not want your father arrested? I'm so sorry you're going through this. God, that's horrible. I'm so sorry, Sarah. Your sister didn't deserve this and neither did you. Sarah, holy shit. I am so sorry this happened to you. Ugh, that's awful. This BuzzFeed tweet was the one we spoke about noticing at the top of this episode. We would not have known to reach out to Otavia if we had not seen this tweet. What's fascinating about this whole thing is that Turney could have easily told the truth about the situation. We're certain that with a bit of spin, some of her fervent online followers would have sided with her over Otavia anyways. It's interesting that the truth wasn't enough. She seemed so determined to set up Otavia as the villain and victimizer that she needed to erase any potential for nuance. This is not the first time she's made a bizarre claim about the legal process. She once suggested she was discouraged from speaking with her relatives because they would also be witnesses in Alyssa's case. That seems bizarre, legally speaking. Her social media posts around her sister's case also indicate that she's not used to people questioning her narrative. 
By saying that I took her to court to make her stop talking about her sister or to stop her from advocating for her father's arrest, Sarah left many people thinking that I treated Alyssa's murder as some type of intellectual property. The conclusion that has been drawn was that I sued Sarah for monetary gain, that I'm greedy and didn't want her to make her own podcast on the same subject. Sarah herself has used the word lawsuit when talking about the injunction. And in fact, those lies were interpreted that way by many of the people who read them. On the subreddit Alyssa Turney, someone recently posted the following question. Does anyone know what happened to Octavia Zapala, the creator of Missing Alyssa? I can't find her anywhere. Comment from user number one. I say good riddance. She tried to stop Sarah Turney from telling Alyssa's story by suing her. What BS? Comment from user number two. Oh my God, seriously? That's crazy. Comment from user one. Sarah posted something about it on Twitter in the past month or two, and she said she was really hurt. Comment from the original poster. Oh wow, I didn't know that. That's too bad that she did that. Ironically, one of the four rules of this group is rumors or misinformation. Please don't spread rumors or post things that could be considered libelous. Yet this rumor and misinformation was spread by Sarah herself. Here's another example of the ramifications of those lies. Several comments also popped up on that BuzzFeed story. Most of them were left from brand new accounts that hadn't commented on any other story. Sarah didn't start missing Alyssa. The creator is Octavia McHenry. She didn't want Sarah advocating for the arrest of her father. And when Sarah did, Octavia took her to Sarah court. Sarah Turney's podcast is actually called Voices for Justice. It's an incredible podcast that I highly recommend people listen to instead of missing Alyssa. Please credit Sarah Turney's podcast, VFJ, for being the reason to reopen Alyssa's case. The MA podcast caused Sarah a lot of trauma and has monetized off of her sister's hey, BuzzFeed. Death. The one who deserves credit for the arrest in Alyssa's case is her sister Sarah and her show VFJ. And she's talked about how working with missing Alyssa was traumatic for her. I have to ask why Sarah Turney chose to say that I took her to court to make her stop talking about her sister slash making her own podcast slash advocating for her father's arrest. I mean, she didn't have to talk about the court proceedings at all, but if she felt like she needed to, why say those things instead of telling the truth? This is just my personal speculation, but perhaps it would have been embarrassing to say that she was served with an injunction against harassment. Why didn't Sarah produce the paperwork or quote from it in her posts or on her podcast? Moving on to another topic, in this recent post, Sarah admitted that the reason she started her own podcast was because of me. Here it is again. I had to create a whole other podcast because the creator of the Missing Alyssa podcast did not want me advocating for my father's arrest. But according to what she testified during the injunction against harassment hearing, her Twitter post about revealing the real reason why she started her own podcast wasn't referring to me at all. Here she seems to say the opposite. In addition, she said the following on her Voices for Justice podcast on June 1st, 2023. I alluded to speaking about a bad experience with a podcast and bam, I was hit with a legal order. You know what I mean? End quote. This is far from trivial. Because the judge ruled against me in part because she believed Sarah when she testified that she wasn't referring to me or to my podcast in that tweet. But in these recent statements, Sarah is saying the opposite of what she said in court. Had she admitted that in court, the outcome may have been different. One other piece of misinformation spread by Sarah revolves around money. In the comments section of one of her old Twitter posts where she discusses being taken to court, she replied the following when someone asked her to go into more detail about what happened. I'm not sure I'm ready to open that can of worms just yet. And honestly, I don't think the creator deserves the attention that would stem from it. And they've made it clear that they have no issue dumping mass amounts of money into keeping me quiet. That's how bad it was. Recently, she posted this comment. I basically spent my life savings paying to get my right to talk about my sister back. So to be clear, according to court documents, Sarah paid her attorney $1,500. That's how much I paid too. Also, once again, she spent that money to fight an injunction against harassment. 
She didn't pay $1,500 to get her right to talk about her sister back because she never lost that right to begin with. Sarah told someone in a private message that was later forwarded to me that we had a falling out because I did really horrible things and that I tried to get my legal fees back from her. Like I said, court records show that actually she filed a motion for me to pay her legal fees. We will add that Turney frequently talks about money in true crime. One fixation of hers is podcasters who make millions off the backs of victims' family members. Perhaps she gets this from her friend Ashley Flowers, who has indeed made millions. But in fairness, Flowers runs AudioChuck, which has its own stable of podcasts. Most independent podcasters make far, far less and are frankly lucky to be able to even do it full time. Turney knows that. She's a podcaster, too. Compensating the victim's family members is another favorite topic. Now, I don't think I've ever seen anyone come out against victims' family members telling their own stories in books, podcasts, or other media and getting paid for their efforts, stories, and labor. But of course, in ongoing cases, that can get into very tricky legal territory. Turney's been a podcaster long enough that she should also know that journalists paying victims' family members for interviews is perhaps the one major way the media can completely botch a case and potentially impeach key witnesses at trial. Turney attempted to shame and silence journalists who've covered her sister's case. She claims she does this out of what she says is an abundance of caution. She doesn't get specific about how basic coverage of her sister's case could be harmful. To be clear, media coverage should not hurt a case, legally speaking. That's simply not how the law works. It is striking to us that this risk-adverse attitude gets thrown out when money comes into the picture, though. Just a couple of weeks ago, on June 1st, 2023, Sarah Turney made various accusations towards an unnamed podcast on her own podcast, Voices for Justice. She didn't specify which podcast she was referring to, but it's easy to draw the conclusion that it was missing Alyssa. The first one is that she was quote, essentially being the executive producer, end quote, of a podcast. And it seems Sarah is saying that she didn't get paid or was exploited. Here it is in her words from Voices for Justice. This was my experience with another podcast where I felt like I was essentially being the executive producer of the podcast. At one point, I was editing the podcast. I was editing things for the podcast, I should say. And again, it's not about like, I want to make millions of dollars off of this. It's like every other person is paid in these positions, but then it's somehow unethical to pay us for the same work. If I am executive producing this in a sense, then yeah, I expect to be treated like any other professional in the business. I don't think that it's fair to exclude us from those positions while we're doing the exact same job description. It feels very much like exploitation, and it doesn't feel good. First of all, I want to make it very clear that my podcast, Missing Alyssa, all 13 episodes of it were entirely researched, written, produced, and hosted by me with some production help by Raz Yalov. The audio editing was done by Raz Yalov with a little help from me. Sarah Turney wasn't involved in the making of any of the 13 episodes, except as one of the people interviewed in the podcast. Her contributions were her recorded interviews where she told her story. To continue documenting Turney's history of hyperbolic claims, let's talk about her own statements on her writing process. She told the alumni magazine for her alma mater, Arizona State University News, that she writes over 100,000 words a week. That's roughly the length of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Every week. That doesn't count researching or outlining or composing sentences, just cranking out prose. I couldn't do that as effectively as I do now without the experience I gained at ASU, Turney told the magazine. For your own reference, by means of comparison, when we write out a script for a half-hour program, It usually runs around 4,000 words. I launched the last episode of Missing Alyssa in 2019. A few months later, Sarah and I, who had always gotten along great up until that point and were by then friends, decided to try and collaborate on a new podcast season together. We talked about working on other cases. That part never happened, but we also agreed that she would help promote the series I had already produced, Missing Alyssa. 
social media and self-promotion aren't really my forte. And so that was to be her focus while I continued focusing on the content itself. This collaboration lasted a very short amount of time. We made it official via an email, a sort of informal agreement that read only a few lines, on May 24th, 2019. And 20 days later, on June 13th, we exchanged another email where we put an end to it following everything that transpired. So she worked for my podcast for a very short amount of time and performed a few tasks on the side, all the while she had a day job. I remember she did some social media related tasks, promotional work like reaching out to people and trying to get gigs like panels, media interviews perhaps. I don't know what she means when she says she did editing for the podcast. This is something she's told other people in private messages as well. The only thing I can think of is she edited a small promo clip for Missing Alyssa that she then asked one of her friends to put on their podcast as a mid-roll or end-roll. So to say that she was an executive producer of sorts is wildly inaccurate and frankly disturbing. Also, she was paid for her work. In the brief, unofficial agreement we exchanged via email, I laid out the terms of the collaboration and how much she would be paid. Considering I wasn't making much more than that, it was a lot. Missing Alyssa was a labor of love, not a profitable production. It was independently produced and self-published. I worked on it for months and months without getting paid. It wasn't until about a year in that I started to recover some of the costs I had incurred during the making of the podcast. And I was sharing a part of these small revenues with Raz. So for me to be paying someone back in 2019 $500 a month, just to perform some promotional tasks, was a lot. My bank records show I paid Sarah a check in the amount of $580 on June 7th. Four days later, Sarah lashed out at me and we stopped working together. Another thing Sarah said on the same episode of Voices for Justice was in regards to a teeny tiny clause that her attorney pointed out to her that would have prevented her from talking about her sister if she hadn't taken it to court to fight it. Once again, she doesn't name me or missing Alyssa, but it's likely given the context and the fact that she states that that was the first time she ever hired a lawyer, which is what she stated about the injunction. These are Sarah's words. There was this teeny tiny clause that I would have never seen if I didn't have a... I hired my first lawyer. I'd never had one before. I had no money. Um, And I had no idea that there was this teeny tiny clause that said you cannot speak about the subject matter of the podcast, which was my sister, which meant I was not allowed to speak about my sister until I went to court and fought it. As you heard, she talks about a clause, but doesn't mention an agreement such as an NDA or a work contract. I don't know what this clause would have been attached to other than an agreement, since injunctions against harassment don't come with clauses. And besides, the injunction was unrelated to her talking about her sister. However, to my knowledge, she has never signed an agreement for me or my podcast other than a one-page waiver I found looking back through my records. It's a basic audio release waiver that she signed before our first interview on December 2nd, 2016. The agreement is very short, written in plain language, and talks about waiving the right to any compensation in exchange for the recorded interviews she was giving for the podcast. I reread this document and can confirm that there's no such clause. In fact, there were no clauses. To the best of my knowledge, this is the only document she signed for me. So if there's another document, I'd be curious to see it. I was also never called in court to discuss a document or clause that Sarah Turney disputed, which I assume I would have been notified if that happened. On top of that, ironically, in the body of the email where I attached the audio release waiver I just talked about, I reassured Sarah that her signing this document wouldn't impact her ability to use the same subject matter for other purposes. I wanted to reinforce that specifically because at the time, she said she had future plans of writing a book about her story. But those confusing statements made on Voices for Justice understandably have left people thinking that I had her sign a document with a sneaky hidden clause. Here's a recent comment from Reddit. What has most recently come out is that Missing Alyssa had guests sign NDAs that they agreed never to publicly speak on what they discussed on the podcast. And Sarah went a judge to have the contract voided. Finally, I will say this. Some people walked away with the impression that Sarah Turney wasn't on board with the making of Missing Alyssa. 
With Sarah being interviewed multiple times on the podcast, these comments are clearly coming from people that haven't listened to Missing Alyssa or looked into it further before commenting. Here is a comment to that effect, for example. Like the previous one, it was posted on the Alyssa Turney subreddit. Sarah also posted on Twitter that she wasn't consulted for the podcast at all. But perhaps it's not surprising that her online followers that didn't listen to my podcast are confused on the subject. On the same episode of Voices for Justice published June 1st, 2023, Sarah Turney said, And it, I mean, it's just insane the way they will take your story and, you know, back it up with free speech. And then the second you try to talk about having a negative experience, they try to shut you down. And it's like, man, it's a two-way street. Like, if you have free speech, so do I. I'm allowed to say, I did not like your production. I did not have a good time on your production. You traumatized me. I did not appreciate the way you went about that. It's like, you should know that this is how the final product that you're receiving is made. Because I think it's important. I, maybe I'm just that person. If that comment is in part about missing Alyssa, then I should make it clear that Sarah did like the production. Or that's what she's always said up until the falling out. She appreciated the content of the podcast and never said she disagreed with any of it. So was there truly a problem with the production or was there a problem with the person creating the content? I have to ask, if my podcast traumatized her like she now says, why did she want to continue working with me, promoting that podcast and making more podcasts together? All of these examples of things Sarah Turney said may seem like they're nitpicking, but I'm making them because they highlight a pattern of behavior. When she's not outright lying, she crafts a statement that is clear enough to be interpreted in a specific way, but too vague to be challenged entirely. She knows what she's saying, and she knows how it will be interpreted, logically, but she's not coming straight out and saying it. Or she says it, then days later deletes it. For one who is so outspoken, we find the fact that Turney publishes and then deletes posts like this very interesting. It sort of seems like similar behavior we've experienced firsthand. We just wonder, does she get nervous about going too far with her claims? Or is it about injecting poison into the bloodstream and then destroying the evidence? If it's the latter, then it seems to be yet another strategy to damage rivals without taking ownership for doing so. And if she deletes tweets like this because they're wrong or she regrets them, then why not come out and retract them? This has been a really painful journey for me. And it's sad that it had to end that way. By making this episode, my only goal is to defend myself and to put an end to the confusion the lies and rumors have caused. I can't address every situation. I've chosen the most important ones. By responding to some of these false allegations, I want to make it clear that moving forward, I have no intention of having an ongoing public back and forth with Sarah Turney. Most people go through at least one falling out in their personal life, but it doesn't mean they're going to try and destroy the other person's reputation or tell lies about them on the internet years down the line. In hindsight, I asked myself why I continued engaging in that conversation with Sarah for as long as I did. Looking back, it seems clear that I should have taken an earlier off-ramp. But at the time, I had no idea things would end up the way they did. I was hoping that there was some sort of misunderstanding and that it could all get sorted out. Maybe I was pretending that things were okay. Not knowing how to fix it, I apologized a lot. Even when I wasn't sure what I was apologizing for. I didn't think I had done anything wrong. Of course, now I know I didn't do anything to deserve what happened. I always had good intentions and a clear conscience. Now I feel silly that I even apologized for things that weren't my fault. I've learned that we really can't take responsibility for other people's behaviors. Sometimes when someone reacts disproportionately to a situation, it means you struck a nerve, but that's not in your control. Over time, I've had to forgive myself for not having the self-respect to stop texting Sarah sooner and say, No, this is unacceptable. I'm not putting up with the way you're talking to me any longer. This experience has made me a lot more aware of red flags and listening to my gut when I feel like a situation is not okay or somebody's acting in ways that are inappropriate. If someone stomps on your boundaries, if they try to make you feel like a bad person or crazy for wanting to have your own boundaries, then run. I think that most of the time, we know it in our gut when something's not right, 
we're just not always in tune with that voice inside because we're used to ignoring it. This experience has taught me that if something seems amiss, then I should listen closely to that voice. Don't disregard it, rationalize it away. There were cracks in the paint long before this all happened. I had just gotten really good at disregarding my own instincts over time. The answer isn't to stop trusting other people. It's about listening to your gut and walking away from situations like that before you lose touch with reality and what's best for you. Even though Sarah told me that it's not about our fight and that I should cover the case no matter what happened between us, when I shared a story about Michael's arrest back in 2020, Sarah and her followers flooded the page with allegations that I had taken her to court and criticism so that I had to shut it down. Aside from sharing that news story, I've spent the past four years staying away from any media coverage of the case. I turned down interviews and declined to comment on the recent updates in Alyssa Turney's case. I've avoided owning my work on the Alyssa Turney story for a long time, even though I'm proud of what I accomplished. And this approach didn't work anyway. So now that we've heard from Octavia, we'll note that we also reached out to Sarah Turney for comment on these issues. She didn't immediately respond to our request. Now, let's sit with this whole strange tale of the -the behind-the-scenes conduct of a prominent true crime ethicist. Turney repeatedly claimed to have been involved in a lawsuit to reclaim her sister's story. We found out from Atavia, from court filings, from texts, that this was actually an injunction against harassment that would have prevented Turney from bashing her former friend to her many social media followers. The language of Atavia's injunction acknowledges Turney's own podcast and makes absolutely no request that she stop talking about Alyssa. Any claims otherwise seem like lies at worst and vast overstatements at best. Turney may argue that perhaps she misunderstood the injunction. We would say that the lie is still a lie and an inaccuracy is still an inaccuracy. I can say the floor is lava. I can even believe that in my heart and feel that it morally justifies me standing on a table to avoid getting scalded. But my claims, even my sincere beliefs, do not make my claims true. And this isn't a matter of Turney keeping her thoughts to the private sphere. She's choosing to take this public and twisting the story to benefit her to her massive social media following. Turney may characterize this as a private falling out between friends. It may have started out that way, but her eagerness to publicly escalate rhetoric around Atavia brings this all into a decidedly more public space. This is stuff that could seriously damage a journalist's reputation. We know from experience what that feels like and how quickly Turney's followers, including her clique of reply guys, which includes multiple podcasters of note, accept all of her claims without question. Turney may even deputize members of her clique of prominent true crime figures to push back against some of these criticisms. It's sometimes hard to understand why allegedly reputable podcasters flock to her, but sometimes siding with the biggest bully in the room can be good insurance to avoid trouble. Turney may claim now that this is all about a few errant tweets and that we're engaging in tone policing. We'd say she can use whatever tone she likes if... She is sticking with the facts and not maligning people based on misinformation. We think that the repeated assertions seem like something other than rashness. It's striking that Turney is relying on falsehoods or omissions to tell this story. She is not telling the truth. Turney may say we're wrong to release anything close to her father's trial. We'd say that Atavia shouldn't have to adhere to anyone's timetable to refute false claims against her. She will point to her status as a traumatized sister of a murder victim. We would say that undergoing a terrible trauma does not entitle you to your own set of facts and a free pass to tell lies and attack others. We would further add that as a public figure, regardless of her background, she has an obligation to be a responsible adult instead of using her following to settle scores. We'd add to all that that we've encountered dozens of victims' family members in our time spent reporting on cases. It would be an inaccurate and unfair generalization to say that all victims' family members behave like Turney. We know because we have talked to them, 
We have cried with them in certain cases. We have heard their frustrations. We have watched them push for more information, more media attention, and harder work from detectives. We have marveled over their advocacy and strength. We can't say that we've seen any of them try to destroy people's reputations with inaccuracies, omissions, and falsehoods. Kearney is very unique in that regard. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murdersheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. Hello, Murder Sheet listeners. Thank you so much for sticking with us until the very end. Just wanted to take a moment as we close out to thank our sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. They are number one for a reason, folks. Kevin and I have been loving the meals we're getting from HelloFresh. We're talking farm fresh produce, protein, all sorts of customizable options to get you exactly what you and your family need. It's very delicious, it's very nutritious, and it's quite affordable. So it ticks off all our boxes. We've been very happy with the service. And, you know, would love for you guys to try it out if you're curious or if you've tried it out in the past and enjoyed it, you know, get that discount. It's HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16. And then you're going to plug in the code MSheet16. You get 16 free meals plus free shipping. You can't beat that. We've really been delighted by it. We work very hard on the podcast. It takes up a lot of time. It's our it's our small business. Um, we really enjoy the work. We enjoy conversing with all of you every week. Um, But at the same time, it's nice for Kevin and I to kind of have something to do outside of office hours. And uh, cooking these meals has been really fun. We're terrible in the kitchen, like disastrous. I mean, like I I, I can tell you horror stories. You know, I I mean, I, I probably shouldn't get into it on the podcast, but I mean, some pretty some pretty disastrous moments involving our cooking, <laughs> you know, n- nothing, nothing life threatening, but definitely stuff that we, we tried to be overly ambitious about and it either went horribly wrong or it ended up costing like way more than it should have. Cause we didn't properly like think about ingredients and uh, we're not, we're not gifted in, in the realm of the kitchen, but HelloFresh makes us pretend like we are because everything is so pre-portioned and pre-planned and the instructions are super clear. So like, you're not going to mess it up if you're like us. And if you're, if you're good in the kitchen, then it's just, it's just less of a hassle and, and you get everything that you need. You don't have to run out to the grocery store. So super nice. Um, try it out. I've really enjoyed the meals that they've sent us so far. I can say that Kevin has too. I highlight that because Kevin is pretty picky when it comes to food. He does not he does not like everything. He has he has pretty strong specifications and preferences. Very much cares about things like fresh produce and and farm produce and things like that. So, he's very picky and I think the fact that he is really enjoying HelloFresh is a testament to the quality here because he's a stickler for that kind of thing. Um and so if you are, I think you will enjoy it as well. And again, the uh, URL and promo code that'll get you a sweet discount is HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16. That's M-S-H-E-E-T 16. And use code MSheet16 